6. The Psychology of Pleasure by Nathaniel Brandon Pleasure for man is not a luxury, but a profound psychological need. Pleasure, in the widest sense of the term, is a metaphysical concomitant of life, the reward and consequence of successful action, just as pain is the insignia of failure, destruction, death. Through the state of enjoyment, man experiences the value of life, the sense that life is worth living, worth struggling to maintain. In order to live, man must act to achieve values. Pleasure or enjoyment is at once an emotional payment for successful action and an incentive to continue acting. Further, because of the metaphysical meaning of pleasure to man, the state of enjoyment gives him a direct experience of his own efficacy, of his competence to deal with the facts of reality, to achieve his values, to live. Implicitly contained in the experience of pleasure is the feeling, I am in control of my existence, just as implicitly contained in the experience of pain is the feeling, I am helpless. As pleasure emotionally entails a sense of efficacy, so pain emotionally entails a sense of impotence. Thus, in letting man experience in his own person the sense that life is a value and that he is a value, pleasure serves as the emotional fuel of man's existence. Just as the pleasure-pain mechanism of man's body works as a barometer of health or injury, so the pleasure-pain mechanism of his consciousness works on the same principle, acting as a barometer of what is for him or against him, what is beneficial to his life or inimical. But man is a being of volitional consciousness. He has no innate ideas, no automatic or infallible knowledge of what his survival depends on. He must choose the values that are to guide his actions and set his goals. His emotional mechanism will work according to the kind of values he chooses. It is his values that determine what a man feels to be for him or against him. It is his values that determine what a man seeks for pleasure. If a man makes an error in his choice of values, his emotional mechanism will not correct him. It has no will of its own. If a man's values are such that he desires things which, in fact and in reality, lead to his destruction, his emotional mechanism will not save him, but will instead urge him on toward destruction. He will have set it in reverse, against himself and against the facts of reality, against his own life. Man's emotional mechanism is like an electronic computer. Man has the power to program it, but no power to change its nature so that if he sets the wrong programming, he will not be able to escape the fact that the most self-destructive desires will have, for him, the emotional intensity and urgency of life-saving actions. He has, of course, the power to change the programming, but only by changing his values. A man's basic values reflect his conscious or subconscious view of himself and of existence. They are the expression of a. The degree and nature of his self-esteem or lack of it, and b. The extent to which he regards the universe as open to his understanding and action, or closed, i.e., the extent to which he holds a benevolent or malevolent view of existence. Thus, the things which a man seeks for pleasure or enjoyment are profoundly revealing psychologically. They are the index of his character and soul. By soul, I mean a man's consciousness and his basic motivating values. They are broadly five interconnected areas that allow man to experience the enjoyment of life, productive work, human relationships, recreation, art, sex. Productive work is the most fundamental of these. Through his work, man gains his basic sense of control over existence, his sense of efficacy, which is the necessary foundation of the ability to enjoy any other value. The man whose life lacks direction or purpose the man who has no creative goal necessarily feels helpless and out of control. The man who feels helpless and out of control feels inadequate to and unfit for existence. And the man who feels unfit for existence is incapable of enjoying it. One of the hallmarks of a man of self-esteem who regards the universe as open to his effort is the profound pleasure he experiences in the productive work of his mind. His enjoyment of life is fed by his unceasing concern to grow in knowledge and ability, to think, to achieve, to move forward, to meet new challenges and overcome them, 
to earn the pride of a constantly expanding efficacy. A different kind of soul is revealed by the man who, predominantly, takes pleasure in working only at the routine and familiar, who is inclined to enjoy working in a semi-daze, who sees happiness in freedom from challenge or struggle or effort. The soul of a man profoundly deficient in self-esteem, to whom the universe appears as unknowable and vaguely threatening, the man whose central motivating impulse is a longing for safety, not the safety that is won by efficacy, but the safety of a world in which efficacy is not demanded. Still, a different kind of soul is revealed by the man who finds it inconceivable that work, any form of work, can be enjoyable, who regards the effort of earning a living as a necessary evil, who dreams only of the pleasures that begin when the workday ends, the pleasure of drowning his brain in alcohol or television or billiards or women, the pleasure of not being conscious. The soul of a man with scarcely a shred of self-esteem who never expected the universe to be comprehensible and takes his lethargic dread of it for granted, and whose only form of relief and only notion of enjoyment is the dim flicker of undemanding sensations. Still another kind of soul is revealed by the man who takes pleasure not in achievement but in destruction, whose action is aimed not at attaining efficacy but at ruling those who have attained it. The soul of a man so abjectly lacking in self-value and so overwhelmed by terror of existence that his sole form of self-fulfillment is to unleash his resentment and hatred against those who do not share his state, those who are able to live. As if, by destroying the confident, the strong and the healthy, he could convert impotence into efficacy. A rational, self-confident man is motivated by a love of values and by a desire to achieve them. A neurotic is motivated by fear and by a desire to escape it. This difference in motivation is reflected not only in the things each type of man will seek for pleasure, but in the nature of the pleasure they will experience. The emotional quality of the pleasure experienced by the four men described above, for instance, is not the same. The quality of any pleasure depends on the mental processes that give rise to and attend it, and on the nature of the values involved. The pleasure of using one's consciousness properly and the pleasure of being unconscious are not the same. Just as the pleasure of achieving real values, of gaining an authentic sense of efficacy, and the pleasure of temporarily diminishing one's sense of fear and helplessness are not the same. The man of self-esteem experiences the pure, unadulterated enjoyment of using his faculties properly and of achieving actual values in reality a pleasure of which the other three men can have no inkling, just as he has no inkling of the dim, murky state which they call pleasure. This same principle applies to all forms of enjoyment. Thus, in the realm of human relationships, a different form of pleasure is experienced, a different sort of motivation is involved, and a different kind of character is revealed by the man who seeks for enjoyment the company of human beings of intelligence, integrity, and self-esteem who share his exacting standards, and by the man who is able to enjoy himself only with human beings who have no standards whatever, and with whom, therefore, he feels free to be himself, or by the man who finds pleasure only in the company of people he despises, to whom he can compare himself favorably, or by the man who finds pleasure only among people he can deceive and manipulate, from whom he derives the lowest neurotic substitute for a sense of genuine efficacy, a sense of power. For the rational, psychologically healthy man, the desire for pleasure is the desire to celebrate his control over reality. For the neurotic, the desire for pleasure is the desire to escape from reality. Now consider the sphere of recreation. For instance, a party. A rational man enjoys a party as an emotional reward for achievement, and he can enjoy it only if, in fact, it involves activities that are enjoyable, such as seeing people whom he likes, meeting new people whom he finds interesting, engaging in conversations in which something worth saying and hearing is being said and heard. But a neurotic can enjoy a party for reasons unrelated to the...